may I have your attention. Please welcome back TechCrunch Managing Editor, Matt Burns. This has felt great, right? Being back in person, doing live pitches with live demos from around the world. I've had a great time. These people have had a great time because they work for me. And this is not that one, he's my boss. But everyone else, I hope you've had a great time this week. So far, we've seen 15 companies present their, their, their startup. And there's five more to go. Then tonight at 8 o'clock, we're going to announce the finalists. And those five finalists will pick tomorrow to another round of judges for a bid to win $100,000 in the Disrupt Cup. But we have five more companies to get through, so let's do that right now. And we're going to meet our judges. We're bringing them out all at the same time right now. Okay, first one up, Peter Boyce. Peter Boyce II is the founder and managing partner at Stalation Capital, an early stage venture capital firm headquartered in Brooklyn. Prior to this, Peter spent eight years as a partner at General Catalyst, an $8 billion venture capital firm that invests in powerful, positive changes that endures. Next, we have Nicole Johnson. Nicole is a partner at Forerunner, and she pays close attention to entrepreneurs with unbridled and around-the-clock passion for whatever they're building. She originally joined the Forerunner team in late 2013 as an investment analyst and team member number three. Next, we have Mariana Senko. Mariana is an early stage venture capitalist and co-founder of Future Ventures. Her firm's early investments in SpaceX, Tesla, Neuralink, Planet, and Skype represent 800 billion of aggregate value creation. Next is Allison Rappaport Stillman. Allison is the founding general partner at Serena Ventures, overseeing partner portfolio management and sourcing new in investments. In addition to growing the reach and impact of the SV portfolio, Allison is the person founders turn to when they need pointed advice, detailed feedback, and tough love. Lastly, we have Pei Wu. Pei is a general partner at SOSV and CTO at IndieBio, where she is responsible for portfolio management and technical oversight. Pei has invested in high-risk solutions to intractable problems in both government and corporate contexts. Please give them a big round of applause. I hope you're ready. I'm ready. The judges, I know they're ready. They've been ready for a while, and here we go. So, introducing the last company in the last, or I'm sorry, the first company in the last round. From Oakland, California, we have Entropic Materials. And presenting for Entropic is Aaron Hall, founder and CEO. Come on out, Aaron. Seven point three billion tons of plastic have been produced since the 1950s, and 86 percent of that is waste. Six point three billion tons of plastic on our land, oceans, air. We're even finding microplastics in babies in the womb. This is insane. And so, why are we producing so much of this stuff? It's because it's absolutely amazing. Plastics are a critical part of our modern economy. They are an enabling technology in just about every single thing that you and I all love to use. They're a $600 billion industry, so they're not going away anytime soon, unless we have something to do with it. At Entropic Materials, we're commercializing a breakthrough technology that lets us stabilize enzymes and package them up inside of the plastics, so they can self-degrade when we're done with them. Now, plastics are made of something called polymers, and polymers are all around us, be it cellulose in vegetables, chitin in crab shells, gluten in your mac and cheese. I used to be a chef, so I kind of think in food stuff. They're everywhere. The list goes on and on and on. And we don't worry about these things polluting our planet. Why not? Because there's another class of polymers called enzymes. And these enzymes can break down those materials and let them go back to the planet where they belong. The enzymes act like scissors, cutting up the individual chains so that there's nothing left behind. And great, let's use enzymes, right? Well, unfortunately, no. We haven't built our systems around that. We've been focused on recycling. Recycling is great when it works, but it's fragmented, complex, it's laborious, the margins are low, it's a hard sell. So we made compostable plastics. Well, that's great, right? Well, sort of. Uh, yeah, they break down, but you need industrial compost to do that, and those pieces of infrastructure are not all that available. 
uh, and the degradation is slow even when it gets in. And we haven't been able to use enzymes to do the work directly until now. At Entropic Materials, we solve the problem from the inside out. We take enzymes and wrap them in our special proprietary coating that acts like PPE and enables us to take these fragile molecules and put them inside the plastics, where they can be triggered to degrade the materials from the inside out. Now, I couldn't bring a whole compost pile up here, and the polymers are not going to break down in six minutes, which actually is probably a good thing. So you'll have to trust me that materials like this, with our enzymes inside of them, break down. And I'll show you some pictures from some of the peer-reviewed publications that we put out in Nature and Science and Advanced Materials, some of the best journals in the world. Here's a polymer film just like the one I showed you. It goes white in just a couple of days. And those white flakes are so brittle that you can pick them up and they turn to powder. We can do this with a wide variety of different plastics. And they completely return to the soil at the end of life. We can also break them down in warm water baths. And this is really important because that's simple infrastructure that's easy to scale and maybe gives us a chance to think about decentralizing our waste stream. And if you do this in an industrial environment, you could actually recapture it and get chemical recycling for a circular economy. And one more thing. We're able to degrade from one end to the other through some clever engineering work that we were able to do, which means we stop microplastics at the source. We're developing a drop-in additive that's readily scalable. Enzymes are incredibly efficient, so we only need to use a little bit, and the degradation is on demand. It requires water and heat. It doesn't happen just on its own. We're starting with PLA, which is the first compostable plastic. It's a $3.5 billion market, and it's one of the fastest growing segments within the industry. And we've chosen this because it opens up a couple of interesting avenues. The first being an expanded design space for products, so we can see more than just cups and bottles and bags being labeled as compostable. We also unlock some of the regulatory burdens, and we enable a wider variety of favorable conditions at the end of life. And we're the right team to do the job. I spent five years at UC Berkeley doing my PhD in material science and engineering, developing this technology. And Jolene has over 11 years of experience scaling up materials in biotech from her time at Ripple, Amaris, and others. We've also been grateful and we're also very thankful, and we've been lucky enough to have support from the Department of Energy, National Science Foundation, Activate, and a wonderful set of investors in our seed round earlier this year. So connect with us. For brands and users of plastics that are hoping to make an impact, we're going to be doing our first pilots next year, and we'd love to welcome you in on that. And we're also expanding our team. So for those who want to make a real impact on the world and deliver some interesting technology, both in this space and a lot of others that are coming, please reach out. At Entropic Materials, we're changing the way that we make and break materials so that we can live more harmoniously with nature. Please join the movement. Thank you. That was great, Aaron. Well done. Thank you. Mariana, let's start with you. Yeah. Um, the first question that I have is on cost. When you talk about um, there is a lot of use of plastics, the counter use to plastics is either figure out how to recycle them or use compostable materials. Compostable materials are increasingly coming down in cost. Recycling is coming down in cost. How does your additive compare within that landscape? Yeah, absolutely. It's a really good question. So we are working with, uh, so at the beginning at least, we're working with enzymes that are readily available. They're already used in a lot of consumer goods, uh, as is things like laundry detergents and cleaners. And so those enzymes are not so expensive compared with a lot of the specialty stuff you'd find in the pharmaceutical environment. Uh, we're still working through our detailed COGS models, but we've done some back of the envelope conversations with some advisors that have spent a long time in the industry. And we're looking at sort of the tens of dollars per kilogram range, which is well within the sort of five to $50 range that plastic additives tend to be in. And because we're very efficient, we only need to use very small amounts. So we're looking at maybe one point, you know, small numbers, not two, three, four X. Got it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Nicole? Thank you. Um, so, so you start with the additive product for PLAs. Do you wind up competing with the PLA manufacturers over time? No, we don't. So we actually solve some really key problems that they face 
which is one, they would love to be able to degrade outside of that industrial compost, which is what's required now, and that mm -hmm. infrastructure is pretty rare. So we're gonna be able to expand those degradation conditions to a wider one. And then the second is that in order to have a product be labeled as compostable, which of course any brand that's adopting needs to be able to do that in order to communicate the value to the consumer, it has to break down in 84 days, which means there's this design tension of I'm designing for performance mm -hmm. and degradation at the same time. And we basically have a pair of scissors that can cut. And so you can design for performance the way we've done in the past with recyclable materials, mm -hmm. knowing at the end it's gonna break down. So hopefully we can see a wider variety of products, not just the sort of food service wear that we typically see. Got it, thank you. Yeah. Hey, let's go to you. So are you planning to be a packaging company or are you planning to be an enzyme company? No, we're an enzyme stabilization company and this is the first vertical that we're exploring. We have a lot of interesting angles uh, of using enzymes that we're exploring and doing market research on now that go beyond plastics as well. Peter? Yeah. As you think about the ideal profile of kind of customers you want to pilot with, what are the, the aspects of a, a brand or a product that you want to prioritize working with first? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think it's a, a strategic one. I was in some plant-based food stuff early and I saw, you know, impossible partnering up with David Chang and, you know, sort of rolling out, right? And so uh, obviously like a Patagonia would be an amazing company. They're very mission aligned and values aligned. Um, but we also really want to deliver impact with this part, right? I'm a material scientist. I did polymers. We have a plastic waste problem. These are like my people, right? This is where this came from. And so I also want to scale up over time and really hit, you know, a Nestle, a uh, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, right? Some of these larger players who really make a large impact uh, so we can deliver on both fronts, right? Great. Allison? So how long does it actually take to degrade once you start the trigger? And then where do you see this happening? Is it still going to go through government compostable things? Or are these companies supposed to have their own water vats? Or what is kind of the, the after the product is in market, getting it back to the original state? Yep, that's a great question. So it uh, depends on the conditions we're looking at and a little bit on the product design. But right now, the standard's 84 days it has to hit. Mm -hmm. We've seen rapid degradation in you know, two to three weeks in compost type environments. We've also seen degradation as fast as 36 hours uh, in water bath. And so those are both you know, opportunities that we can think about. Um, in terms of where it goes, I think it's gonna depend a little bit on the locale. So some places have compost, either industrial, formal compost, or more municipal or local um, you know, community compost. So in those cases, we can look at that. Um, possibly home compost, we'll validate that. And so they don't need a special individual, there's not a new technology that needs to happen to trigger these? No, so it's water and heat. So the compost is totally fine with that. The water bath idea is something that we could do, you know, sort of in a home, it's very simple, it's a pretty simple piece of infrastructure. It could also be done at larger scale or could be done at an actual manufacturing plant. If you think about a lot of those like samples, right? You get a rectangle, you cut out a bunch of circle pouches, you're left with that sort of cookie sheet full of holes. Mm -hmm. We could take that scrap, break it down, and then repolymerize it into plastic again for a circular economy kind of approach. Uh, Pay, let's go back to you. Do, does the enzyme have to be um, actually integrated into the polymer, or can you actually develop a whole process to, to do decomposition on, on virgin plastics? Like outside of the... Outside of the composting. Yeah, so in theory, you could have enzymes degrading from the outside in as well. Uh, one of the unique features of our technology is that we actually can get inside the plastic. Uh, and so that's one of the differentiating factors from some of the other companies that are looking at enzyme uh, plastics. But that being said, our technology has been shown to enable us to take enzymes and put them into foreign environments, acellular, you know, things like organic solvents. Uh, and so we get retaining performance and material uh, fun or enzymatic function in those environments. And so uh, I don't think that that's off the table. That's something we could look at as well. It's neat. Mariana, last question, please. Are, are there any constraints in terms of your capacity to have the perfusion of the enzyme through the PLA or plastic, whether size, thickness, type of material? Oh, uh, like in, just in terms of processing? Yeah. Yeah, so what we've done so far, we've done solvent cast films, we've done melt cast film, we've done extruded fibers. Uh, we recently got some injection molding equipment in our lab, a little tabletop unit, so we're going to be doing that. I don't see any reason why we won't be able to integrate into all of those because uh, we're, we're making a master batch. So you take plastic pellets, you add in a little bit of additive as powder, and then it gets processed through the system. Um, we'll be working through and identifying if there are gaps, but Got there's it. lots of engineering we can do on that front too. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. Give, Thanks, them, Aaron. give them a round of applause. Woo.